to the first JCPS. NAACP Collaborative Community Forum for the 22-23 school year. I'm Michelle Patrick, the Education Chair of the NAACP, the Louisville Branch NAACP, and the moderator for this evening. Before we begin, I would like that uh, you keep your microphones muted. This action will eliminate any background noise that may disturb our presenters. There will be a question and answer period and at the, at the end of the presentation. In our efforts to make these forms more viable, there is now an evaluation link for this form. This year, the community form will cover various topics that I hope will be of interest to you. At this time, I would like for Mr. Ian Brandon to talk to you about the links that have been added and to welcome any guests. Good evening, everybody. Uh, like Ms. Patrick said, my name is Ian Brandon. I am the Satellite Office Supervisor for JCPS and co-host of the NAACP JCPS Community Forums. I would like to welcome you all. And at this time, I would like to acknowledge and welcome any board members that we have present. This time, seeing none, um, would like to also extend um, a warm welcome from our chief, Dr. John Marshall. And regarding the links Ms. Patrick mentioned, um, I will have a PD link um, for all the JCPS folks for PD credit. Um, and at the end of the forum, I will showcase the next forum for the month of October. And then there is a brief evaluation link. I would love and encourage you all to complete for us. It just helps us to continue to get better and get direct input from the community. So again, thank you all for attending. I will turn it back over to Ms. Patrick. Thank you, Ian. Tonight, I have the pleasure to introduce our panel of speakers for this evening. Let's begin with Ms. Amanda Everett Bush. She is the Executive Administrator of School Choice. Ms. Bush has a background in social work before transitioning into the field of education. Ms. Everett Bush has served in the role of a special education teacher and counselor. We also have this evening, Dr. Lindsay Bell. She is the choice supervisor. Dr. Bell has served as a mental health counselor in the elementary setting. And Dr. Bell will oversee the outreach portion of the new school choice plan. Welcome ladies. I'm gonna turn this over to you all. Thank you for that introduction. We are excited to be with you this evening. Give us just a second and we're going to pull up our presentation so that we can get started. Okay, so thank you all again for having us join. Um, this will be the first of many opportunities that the JCPS School Choice Office will be providing in order to navigate our community through our updated plan that will go into effect for the 23-24 school year. And so we do plan well in advance. And so we are preparing for our application period. So it's imperative that we um, inform families of their options. And so that will, that will be our focus for this evening. So it is important for everyone to know how um, important the moment on June 1st, 2022 was for our community. We had not had a massive revision to our then student assignment plan for almost 40 years. And so our board voted unanimously. Um, that speaks to the need for change. Um, although change can sometimes be uncomfortable because of the unknowing, it gave us an opportunity to move. 
Um, and so what that will do is lead to a better experience for our students and families. And with our charge, we always lead with equity in mind that will create a transparent and trustworthy system that will build stronger trust for our community. And the JCPS commitment, just to give you an overview of what the plan entailed, was a guaranteed dual reside option for students that live in the choice zone. The choice zone speaks to families that are mostly in West Louisville, um, but others as well. Aligning feeder patterns for the first time as best we could at the elementary, middle, and high school level to create better predictability for families that choose to go to the school based off of their address. Dedicating resourcing and funding for students that need it the most in the choice zone um, that will be implemented in 23-24 through our choice zone support plan. Um, we are also um, committed to transitioning to a new technology system that will allow a more streamlined, transparent process for families to engage in our school choice options. And we're extremely excited about the dedication to outreach to ensure that families understand their options so that they can make an informed decision. So you will also hear about that plan as well as a comprehensive magnet strategy. Um, I, it is no secret um, that magnets in our district may have been, um, the foundation may have been more on creating more exclusive options. Magnets should be to promote diversity and provide access for students to engage in a specialized theme. So we are now committed to a magnet strategy to move us in that direction. Okay, and so just to be sure that we have some common language around what we're talking about, I want to go ahead and just give you a few definitions. Um, and so we're going to be talking about zones tonight. And so a zone is, um, it's going to be three to eight JCPS elementary schools um, that are tied to a specific geographic area, and those are tied to a specific high school. Those, those are what we call our feeder patterns now. Um, and so the zone, every student is guaranteed a seat at a school in their zone, which is based on the home address. We do not, we are not going to be using the word clusters anymore. That might be what a lot of people are familiar with. Um, so now we have elementary zones. Um, dual resides. So this is language that is used to uh, talk about options that students have in the choice zone. Um, and so one of the major components of the new plan is for students who live in the choice zone, which we'll show you a map of here in a minute, to have two options when it comes to choosing their school. So they will have an option to choose um, from a school that's close to their home or a school that's further away from their home. And once they make that selection, that's when their schools will populate that they can rank in their order of preference. So dual resides is just the close to home and further away option. There are also a close to home and further away option at the middle school and the high school level. Um, a transfer, so transfers are um, so we get this a lot, like somebody will say, I need to transfer my child, but what they really mean is that they changed addresses and they need to apply for a different school. And so we want to be clear on what the language of a transfer is. Um, and so transfers are when parents want to explore schools that are not their reside school, and it can also be a school outside of their cluster. Now we do not transfer to magnet schools or programs, um, but transfers, and, and I just use the word cluster again, out of habit. <laughs> Um, but it would be outside of their zone. So a transfer can be for any school that is not a magnet school or program, and it may be within their zone or outside of their zone. Um, magnet programs are programs that have a particular theme or focus. So we have um, whole school magnets. So those are our magnet schools. And then magnet programs are programs within schools. So the school may have some students who attend there based on their address, and then they may have other students who attend there based on their acceptance into the magnet school. So this slide just gives you a visual again of what the choice zone entails. Um, again, it's mostly West Louisville, but does extend past West Louisville. 
And again, to reiterate in our dual resides option, that will mean that students that live within this area will have an option close to home and they will also have an option far away. This option will be guaranteed for all families. So if a family chooses their option close to home, that will be guaranteed. There will not be a default. Our office will not say we're defaulting all students to the close to home or far away. Right now, all of our elementary or incoming elementary students have to submit an application to receive an assignment. So that will be the case for our incoming sixth graders and incoming ninth graders, all families, which is why outreach is so important, which will be a collaborative effort between JCPS and the community to ensure that all families engage in that choice. So families are making this decision that is not a decision that the district will be making on behalf of families. So they will be engaging in this at the elementary, middle, and high school level. And it is all, again, based on their address. Okay, so this this is an example um, for you. And so um, just wanted to see if we could give you a, an example to make it maybe a little bit easier to understand. And so what you see here, um, this is gonna be what we call the Valley Elementary Zone. So this is in the Choice Zone. So, so you have to be a student that lives in the Choice Zone, which is that area that Amanda just showed you on the other slide. So if you're in elementary school, when you uh, receive an application, you log into your application, what's going to come up is, do you want to choose close to home or do you want to choose far away? And based on what the parent selects, that determines which options are going to pop up. And so first, if you choose close to home, you're going to rank Moppin, Kennedy, or King. Those are going to be your close to home options. If you choose far away, you're going to rank Dixie, Johnson Town Road, Medora. Similarly, if you're a middle school student, you're going to select close to home or far away. If you select close to home, you will rank either the Academy at Shawnee or the new West Louisville Middle School. Now, the Academy at Shawnee is a full school magnet program, um, and that's based on part of the proposal that was passed. Um, but Shawnee did express interest in receiving more students from the Choice Zone because they wanna provide access to students living there. And so students will have the opportunity to rank either Academy at Shawnee or New West Louisville Middle School if they choose that close to home option um, and be accepted into the magnet there. And then if they choose the far away option, then they would attend Stewart. And then similarly for high school, they're gonna choose either close to home or far away. If they choose close to home, it will be the Academy at Shawnee High School. If they choose far away, it would be Valley High School. So this is just a little visual for you to understand, um, to kind of see how that application will look once parents log in and get ready to make their selections. Um, and so School Finder, this, this is what we've used all along, um, is our School Finder where you can put in your address and it will populate your schools. Now, you see right here in green, Explore Boundaries for 23-24. So if you use this site right here, these are going to be your 22-23 boundaries, so this current year. You click on the green button here. That's going to take you to your 2324 boundaries. So you can already explore those. So you can go in there, put your address in. Um, if we have any anybody within JCPS here that you're helping students, you can go in there, put a student's address in, and it's going to tell you your elementary, middle, and high school options. If you're in the choice zone, it will tell you that close to home and far away options. Um, it will tell you your traditional boundaries. And so those are already available for people to explore what the options are going to be for them. And I will say too on School Finder, although we do have it in green where you can click on the link, before showcase, it will be just in the regular drop down. So where it says 22, 23, it will also have that option for 23, 24 there as well. Okay, so some important things to remember. 
And we want to ensure that everyone in the community understands that the new plan will impact incoming kindergartners, sixth grade and ninth grade um, for the 23-24 school year. So we are a, a large district of almost 100,000 students. So we wanted to make sure in this transition that we weren't disrupting um, current students from their school. So it will be kindergarten, sixth grade and ninth grade. So incoming transition grades. Students who are currently enrolled will remain at their current school unless there is an address change. If there is an address change, they will follow the new plan. If that address does change and let's say the family does live in the choice zone, then they will have the option to do the close to home far away, just like the incoming K6 and 9. We, in, we do have um, seventh grade and eighth grade. Of course, if their address changes, we will have swing space for incoming sixth graders. And so the Academy at Shawnee Middle expressed interest that if a student is new to the district or if their address changed and they wanted an option close to home, that they could explore the Academy at Shawnee Middle as an option. So again, we're wanting to make sure that you know, we are as equitable and have access for families. So we appreciate the Acad Academy at Shawnee Middle for being willing to provide that option because we will only have swing space for incoming sixth graders while we are uh, building a new West Louisville Middle School. We will be prioritizing transfers um, for siblings. Um, we will be doing that based on space or capacity in, in the building. But under the new plan, we do understand that there may be older siblings that are following the current plan and an incoming kindergartner that would be following the new plan. So we will be prioritizing our student transfer process to accommodate families as best we can. And then also, and I've already spoke on this a little bit, but School Mint will be our new technology platform that we will be transitioning to when the application period opens up on November the 1st. October, um, we will be training um, our staff. We will be out in ensuring that families have communication on setting up their account. They did say our current families, they would be able to do a mass um, send out for families to be able to create accounts so that we can get ready for that November 1st launch date for our online application. And again, this platform will be unlike what we have endured in the past. It will be a process for our online registration for new families, all of our applications, and any student registration forms that we have annually in one platform. And that is something that we have never had before. Um, and so they also have the ability to translate in the application. That is something that will be new for our district and much needed. Um, and they have the ability to do electronic notifications to families in a dashboard where you can check the status of any wait list or the status of any applications that you have submitted. So we are extremely excited to get this platform up to provide to our families. I did also want to express how, where we are with our journey on exploring our magnets. And these are just some really high level areas of what we are currently working on and our new plan um, committed to ensuring that when we implement magnets in JCPS, that they are aligned with magnet schools of America. I think it's important for everyone to understand that this is not something that is coming from the school choice office. This is not something that's coming from JCPS. This is something that we are following as best we can to ensure that we are meeting best practices that are set by magnet schools of America. And so the purpose of a magnet is diversity. So this year, once school gets settled in just a bit, we will be working with individual magnets to um, determine 
diversity targets and goals. So how do we ensure that your magnet reflects the district average? So we will be setting those with individual schools. It will not be a one size fit all. Those will be individual conversations and schools will be running their criteria through the REAP process and doing a root cause analysis so that we can determine why that is. Um, we also will be reviewing non-magnetic magnets that this year. And that means that you have a theme that's being implemented and there are not students based on your data that are interested in that magnet theme. Um, so making a decision whether it is removed or reimagined um, as we move forward, because at this point, we are implementing JCPS magnet standards that are aligned with Magnet Schools of America. Magnet Schools of America is coming in. We actually you know, have our first meeting coming up soon, soon with our magnet schools. They are providing professional development. This year is going to be very foundational on how we are committing to move forward with magnets, making sure everyone is on the same page. And this will be something that will be a journey for us. Um, this is not something that's gonna magically be fixed in several months or a year, but we are making sure that we're putting things in place to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. And a big part of this is gonna be that continuous improvement and making sure that we have magnet coordinators that can assist in ensuring that the theme is implemented with fidelity and that we have that dedicated magnet resourcing and support to ensure that the theme is viable and implemented as it should be, and making sure that we have magnets in our district that are MSA certified. That means they've gone through a certification process and they are doing what they are supposed to be designed to do. So we are looking forward again, this is not gonna be a magic fix, but I am truly excited that we are starting on this journey. Okay, so I'm going to discuss just a little bit about the outreach plan. So as you all know, the outreach um, was one of the five major components of the school choice plan that was passed. Um, and so um, for outreach, we're super excited. We have hired two outreach coordinators, and um, that's Michelle Foree and Kayla Taylor. And so they are, they're, one of their um, main responsibilities and roles is to be working in collaboration with other um, community partners, with other district departments to make sure that we're reaching as many students as we can to get them to apply and to apply on time. Um, and also just to know what their options are. So especially with so many changes this year, we want the community and we want families to be informed about what options they have in terms of their making the school choice that's best for their child. Um, so we're working on solidifying community partners so we've been working with various agencies. Um, we've been working with um, NCFL, the National Center for Families Learning. We've been working with Ready for K. Um, we met this morning with some of our um, community agencies that work with our um, international community. Um, and so we're really working on these collaborations both internally and externally, um, DEP and access and opportunity. So we're working to try to capture as many students as we can um, so that we can reach as many students as we can to make their choice. Um, updating our marketing and communications materials, transitioning our school choice proposal website to be housed on our former student assignment page. Um, transition tracking, that applies to counselors. So we'll be working collaboratively with our school counselors, particularly um, those in the choice zone to help students in transition grades to make that selection. And so we are gonna have transition nights at every school in the choice zone. We will also have walk-in hours at the schools there um, so that families, if they can't make the transition night, we will have our outreach coordinators there on site on particular days so parents can walk in and receive one-on-one -on -one assistance in understanding their options and completing their applications. And um, so that tracking tool just helps us keep track of who has applied, who still needs to apply, and who we need to reach out to to try to make sure that they get their application in on time. Um, and then professional development for school staff. And so we've talked about that with both the magnets, with School Mint, that will be um, necessary with our new technology platform. So we'll be doing pro professional development there. Okay. 
Okay, so this is just a, t a brief timeline of activities. And so in August, of course, we were doing a lot of back to school events, preparing for the 22-23 school year um, and developing some community partnerships there to make sure that students were enrolled and ready. Um, a big uh, event that we have coming up is Showcase of Schools, October the 15th at the Kentucky International Convention Center. Um, and so this year it will be organized a little differently than it has been years in the past. It will be organized by zones. Um, and so there will be computers set up where families can come in, they can put in their address under the new boundaries, find out what their school options will be, and then they can go to that zone to talk to the schools that are there that are available to them. Um, there will also be a choice zone section um, so that students living in the choice zone can go to the schools that are the close to home options um, and speak to those schools there. And then our, we'll be there, of course, to answer any questions that we can for families about their school options. Um, we also send out transition letters. So all of our early childhood fifth and eighth grade families receive a letter that is individually unique to them that tells them what their options are from their home, explains how to log into the application, um, and they receive those before the application period opens and then school transition events. So I talked about making sure we have transition events and we won't only have them in choice zone schools. We're also gonna have them at community agencies. Um, we actually have some schedule with the satellite office at Shawnee in California. Um, and we'll have them with other community agencies that are willing or, or want to have us. So I don't know who we have here on this meeting, but if there is anybody who's interested in collaborating with us on a transition night, we would love to do that. I mean, I'll share my information to, so we can connect there. The application period opens November 1st of this year, 2022, and um, closes December 16th, 2022. Now, that's what we consider on-time applications. That does not mean that parents and families cannot apply after that December 16th deadline. Um, it just means that those are the on-time applications, and so uh, the applications that are on time, parents are more likely to get one of their top choices of schools. Um, and then additionally, that's that magnet application period. And any magnet applications received after that actually go in a late file, which can only be accessed if schools still have space. So that's why it's super important to get that application in on time as much as possible. Um, and then Janu um, January through July, um, dual resides enrollments, so we'll be doing those enrollments in Infinite Campus. We'll monitor address changes to update dual reside choices, and then the student transfer window always opens that first Monday in May, um, and so that's when students can so it, a lot of students who've already applied will receive their assignments, and if they are interested in a different school, they can apply for a transfer at that time. Um, and then we'll continue to have community outreach events and try to get as many people as possible to apply um, for their and make their selection. And then August of 2023, that's when the school year will begin. We'll first implement the dual resides. Um, current, Amanda talked about this earlier, but current students that are not the, those transition ages will be able to stay in their current schools. Um, and so they can stay there unless they have an address change and they will fall under the new plan. I will say um, for transitioning to this slide as well. So dual resides is an additional choice for families. So families still have the option of engaging in all of our magnet programs and engaging in our student transfer process. This is just an additional option for families that live in the choice zone that historically have not had an option close to home as a school based on their address. So all of the other options are still there. This is sort of icing on top of the cake for them. That cake there it is still available. And so we just, we know that that is a lot of information, but the more that we can engage and talk to the community and talk to families, we want there to be better understanding of this plan. And of course, um, just remembering our why, I always talk about the North Star. How do we maintain our North Star and what does this provide us? And so again, Choice Zone students 
had an option to stay close to home that students in the suburban areas have had an opportunity to have previously. Now students in the choice zone also have that option. Again, the family will be engaging in this choice. JCPS will not be making this choice on behalf of families. We will have improved feeder patterns. As a former school counselor, it was extremely difficult at the high school level to determine all of the elementary and middle schools that were feeding in to the school that I was at. Now we have better aligned feeder patterns. So you're gonna be able to have those collaborations between levels, families know and can start from the beginning and know where their end is going to be if it's based off of their address. But again, families can still um, engage in our other options through magnets and through our student transfer process. And all of this, again, we're focused on equity. We wanna increase access to our school choice options. We wanna be transparent. We wanna make sure that we're increasing trust within the community by doing this right here. And all of this will lead us to positive student outcomes. And that's what it's all about. That's our why. Um, so hopefully this has been able to provide you with more information on how we're moving forward to prepare for the 23, 24 school year. And this will be a journey, a collaborative journey that we will all travel together. So we thank you. Thank you, ladies. Uh, we appreciate your time um, and that vital information. It, it's a lot to take in. We do have a few questions. This brings us to our, uh, our question and answer period. What we ask is that for you out there, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat. Or if you have a question you would like to ask, just hit the little raised hand thing and Ian or I will acknowledge you. Uh, we have uh, 20 minutes of questioning, <laughs> might be longer. I think I, do we have a question down there? I see somebody uh, lit up. I guess maybe they're not, they just lit up. We're going to remember to keep your mics off why the questions are being asked for those that are just listening so we don't have background information. So I, 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 I'm gonna start off with the first question, okay, to, to get this. Um, and you all, you all did an excellent job in answering a lot, but you know, you, you said you got, and this just came off my head thinking, you got a choice plan, you got a dual reside plan and you got a magnet program. Do, is the dual reside and the choice the same? Or is that the dual reside is the option for families in the choice zone in to have an option close to home and far away? Okay. So it's the dual resides is the concept. The choice zone is the geographic area that it's speaking to. And dual resides is that there are two choices. Gotcha. One close to home and one far away. Okay. Or depending on the number of schools, but you have the option close to home and far away. Okay. Um, Ian, you wanna ask a question? Yeah, can you, um, I think you, you briefly touched on it, but can you reiterate the, the reasoning as to why the door was at starting with um, kindergarten, sixth and ninth? So those are our transition years. So students are transitioning if they were, you know, in early childhood or not with us for the first time in kindergarten. Students are transitioning to another level from fifth to sixth. Students are transitioning from eighth to ninth. So those are our entry grades at each level. And we wanted to ensure that we were doing what was gonna be best for transition and, and least disruptive for families. If we said every student, almost 100,000 students needed to follow the new plan, that would not leave them with that opportunity to remain in that current school. What if they are a 10th grader in high school and they're in a career pathway with Academies of Louisville and now their new boundary has them attending a new school and they can't reach certification, industry certification in that pathway. We did not want to negatively impact students and families in this transition. So those entry grades were important to begin with. 
you all talked about uh, <clears throat> magnet, uh, whole magnets uh, and magnet programs. Um, I would, and would you explain the whole magnet concept and the, uh, the second part of that question, will you still have uh, magnet programs within other schools? Will that still be there? And will they also have to follow the criteria with the magnet schools of America? So everyone will be following um, JCPS magnet standards. We will be traveling the journey together, whether it's a magnet school or a magnet program. So how the best way to think of it is a magnet school means that there is no reside area. There is no address where, where it says that you can go to this school. Everyone has to apply, complete an application and be accepted to be in a complete magnet school. A magnet school is wall to wall, everyone had to complete an application. A magnet program means that there's both. You have students that apply to attend that school and then you also have students that attend that school based off of the address. Now, they can both operate, but your implementation of the theme, we are working toward having that wall to wall. So if you are Mazik, that is a magnet MST program, just because we have students that are applying there to uh, explore and have that offering of the MST program does not mean that students that attend there based on their address should not have that access as well. So program versus school is how students get to that building and whether there is a reside or an address attached to where they automatically go to that school or whether an application is needed. So I'm hearing you say that now it's going to be more inclusion. Uh, yes. Okay. With those students who live in that area, that it won't no longer be a school within a school. Now, I will tell you, this is going to be a shift for our district because there are cases where that does not occur. And that is one of the huge things with our change with just using Hawthorne as an example, because it's a Spanish immersion school. It was a cluster school, so families could be assigned there based on the cluster. And then it was also a Spanish immersion program that families could apply to. They did implement wall-to-wall -wall Spanish immersion, but some families were engaging in that cluster application, one, not knowing that they were ranking a Spanish immersion school, and two, they may not have wanted that or felt like it was the best fit for their student. So that is why that whole school model for Hawthorne, using that as an example, is so important because families need to know what they're signing up for. If you want your child to engage in Spanish immersion, that option is there, but it should not necessarily be that we as a school choice office are, are assigning a student there. When you're in fourth grade, if you're receiving instruction in Spanish, that's difficult. It would be difficult for me um, to receive core content instruction in Spanish. Ian, I think there's a question in the chat. Did you get that? <clears throat> So do we know what percentage of students who reside in choice areas participate in magnet programs currently? So I do not have that percentage with me, but historically I will say that that percentage is lower than what we want to see. So with our outreach, it is not only um, engaging in the dual resides option close to home and far away for our students that live in the choice zone, but we definitely want to encourage families to engage in our magnet schools and programs as well. So again, that additional choice, and that is why that outreach is so important because sometimes families may not be aware but I also want us to be careful, too, because sometimes families want to go to their school based off of their address. It's just making sure that we have informed families so that they can, again, make that decision for the, for the student. 
And I think just um, to um, piggyback off that a little bit, when we are talking about our magnet schools and programs and the new plan that was passed and particularly our diversity targets and goals in doing the root cause analysis um, and making sure that we are understanding what does the applicant pool look like? What do the students who have been admitted look like? Um, and then what is the goal that we need to set to move that toward a more equitable um, admissions process? And um, whether that's a lottery-based admission or criteria admission, how do we look at that and make sure that it is equitable and we're increasing access, particularly for our black and brown students? Um, and so that is a big part of this, of our school choice plan um, and moving the work forward and even meeting the Magnet Schools of America standards, which we know one of the standards for Magnet Schools of America is diversity. Um, and so that is a goal and, and we really wanna align with that in terms of our Magnet Schools and our programs um, and making sure that we're aligning with what the purpose of Magnets originally was. You talked about uh, Magnet things. What are they? <laughs> How many themes are there in the various Magnets? And who determines these themes? So I'm going to speak in terms of you, you won't necessarily see a specific number. What I will say is if you look at Magnet Schools of America, there are your more popular themes that have a K through 12 pathway. And some examples of those popular themes, it does not mean that it encompasses every theme that you will see throughout districts across you know the US but you will mostly see strands of visual performing arts math science and technology steam stem coding those types of things montessori international studies or global studies or immersion whether that's you know a strand of a world language, those are the big buckets that you will see as far as themes go. Now there may be subgroups under those big buckets, but as far as Magnet Schools of America, that's what you typically see. Now they don't say that's all there can be, but it is important and it's something that we probably need to improve on is ensuring that students have access to continue or have that continuation of a theme from elementary, middle and high as best we can for, for families. Ian, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Just to kind of piggyback off that, off that question, is it difficult to transition in between the two different programs? Let's say you want to start into a magnet and then decide that that's not for you. What does that look like and um, how does that process work? So right now um, and in our new plan, there are no more school initiated exits from magnets. That means that a magnet school or program can no longer say your student cannot continue, that that's something that was annually, that is no longer. We do still have a parent initiated exit. So it, at any time a parent feels like it is not a good fit for their student, they are able to exit that magnet school or program and retain, attend the school or selections based off of their address. Um, the, uh, what about the curriculum that I'm getting back to things that, mm -hmm. uh, that is to develop uh, for these themes. And, and what about the accountability? It, is, is it aligned with the district? And can you all answer so that? Well, and I think the best way to approach this question is to think about schools in the sense that you have your core content areas. So your right. math, science, social studies, language arts, depending on what level or English, whatever you're calling it, magnet, themes are an enhancement. So a lot of times, and let's just say it's math, science, and technology, you're going to see that math, science, and technology incorporated into the curriculum, but your curriculum for your core content, that, 
that is set. And that's based on our accountability standards. This is to enhance, to engage students so that there is a positive student outcome that comes from this. When, when your child is engaged and they say themes are able to do that, then that increases student achievement because they want to come to school. That spark about engaging in that coding class or gaming class, or if it's visual performing arts and they love theater and they're going into their language arts and they're reading about theater because that's incorporated in their core content and that's what they love to do, that's where that increased engagement comes from. Do we have any goals around raising student achievement um, with this assignment plan and have we had success with magnets that we could talk to um, that is more consistent with the performance of African-American students in those magnet programs that we currently have? So I will say, and in, in, I guess it'll be two parts. So with our choice zone support plan, and that will be implemented in 23-24, we're currently in the process of hiring the director of the choice zone. This year will be a baseline year for all schools, so collecting that baseline data and then setting goals to be able to track accountability, but that will not be, we'll be doing that planning to prepare for implementation for the 23-24 school year. And so magnet schools and programs should be located in your urban core, which should be in the choice zone. So then you're going to have that level of accountability there as well. Since we're talking about accountability and I always think about teachers when we talk about accountability. So my question is, uh, are teachers in magnet schools selected differently from other teachers? So and if I'm, not, why? Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm going to say historically, I don't know how much of that has necessarily occurred, but I will say um, that in the past year, we did sit through an MSA school redesign process that was pretty intense. Um, and we're, we were excited to sit through that because now we do have Western High School, which is going to be our model with following best practice to implement a magnet in this district. So that will be our protocol because that should occur. You know, if you have a theme, then that should be a part of your hiring decision. Um, I just don't know if I can speak to how much that occurred in the past, but definitely how we're moving forward. And Michael, did you, and Michael's the director of, and it's student assignment, but it's school choice, but jump in, Michael. Oh, I think the other thing that we just have to be mindful of when we talk about teachers and hiring is the teachers union and contracts that our school district has uh, with the teachers union and those processes. So um, if there isn't anything specifically um, that's in the memorandum of agreement or the contract, like there's not going to be a different uh, hiring mechanism or protocol for magnet schools versus any other schools. Okay. But I, I guess what I was thinking of is that there has to be some kind of speciality since mm -hmm. this is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yes. You know, I think that's the, the I think that's the goal. Um, but I think also back to when you think about Amanda's point, I think at a basic level, all of our schools have the same standards in terms of what the state says students ought to know and be able to do at each grade level, right? Beyond that, when you talk about the specialized themes, yes, with the professional development that is provided to those schools and those teachers, you could expect, um, I think, something different in terms of what instruction looks like for sure. But at the basic level, everybody's teaching reading, math, science, social studies, writing. Um, the standards per the state apply to everybody. I think how that's differenti differentiated with the theme is where that may come into play some. Mm -hmm. Like if you have visual performing arts, if you have someone that's been involved in theater, of course, that is something that would be a good fit for that school. Or if it's Western high school that's going to have STEM and coding, then definitely an, a person with an engineering background would be someone that we would want to have um, in front of students. So absolutely. We have a question in the chat. Uh, I thought I heard that choice schools, and in parentheses is elementary, where they have reduced class size. 
how will we achieve this with the teacher shortage that the district district is experiencing? Um, I that's it is going to be a challenge. I mean, I don't think anyone can can say that it is not. Um, it is still something that we are committed to. And I will say that our consultant that we worked with on this proposal um, that works with other large districts as well, um, we do have capacity in our choice zone. And so we, we will be able to honor that. I mean, she made sure that we had capacity to one, guarantee our dual <laughs> reside option, our close to home far away. Um, and then we will, I mean, it is, it is definitely um, what we said. So we're going to do what we said we're going to do because that's how we build trust in the community. <laughs> I do also think we have to give each other grace through this um, because this is going to be something new for our district. And, and if there are kinks or bumps along the road, I just ask that again, we have that grace and we have those conversations collaboratively um, so that we can address any issues that we run into. But definitely the teacher shortage is, is something that, that could be a huge impact. Uh, could, here's another question. Could you detail what outreach will look like in terms of solidifying community partnership? Could you give examples of what kind of community partners and what is the mission is envisioned for this? So um, I would say that two parts to this question. So our immediate application period is coming open in November. Um, and so in terms of solidifying community partners, we wanna work with as many community partners we can to as reach as many students and families as we can. Um, but having those solid relationships moving forward will take more time than just this month and a half that we have um, to start the application period. So I wanna speak about right now and then in terms of moving forward. Um, and so right now our goal is to work with community partners across the city, but also particularly in the choice zone. Um, that can be spaces where we can reach families and provide access for families to be able to complete their applications and receive one-on-one -on -one assistance. And so we do have some existing relationships already um, with groups that we've been a part of where we have our family and community engagement group through JCPS. We have our satellite offices. Um, we have our um, our English language learner department has an ongoing meeting with a group that we're working with there. Um, we have our diversity, equity, and poverty department that have some ongoing relationships. And so we've worked with um, both DEP to look over our plan, our parent and family engagement to look over our plan. And then it will go through our REAP process to make sure that we are including um, as many partners as possible to reach all of our students. Um, and so we have, we're, we are wanting to move to have also a mobile registration and hopefully work with a community partner with that. So I don't want to name any, we have meetings set up in the works and I don't want to name anyone specifically at this point because we haven't, we haven't established that, um, but we're working as quickly as possible to solidify those partnerships that can help us with this immediate application period. Um, long term, we really want to cultivate a group of community members and parents who are committed to this work and can help um, have, be ongoing partners in that learning about what the process is so that if a family comes to their agency, they'll be able to help them find what their options are. Um, they'll be able to know how to navigate our system. They'll be able to help maybe um, let them have access to technology there to be able to complete the application. So the long-term vision is that we will have a solid group of parents and community partners that will help us um, and build on the social networks that already exist and they're trusted um, with the parents and can be resources for parents there. Um, our immediate need is by November to have many events to partner with all of our schools in the choice zone um, and to make sure that we are having every student in transition grades in the choice zone and those who need to register for kindergarten um, to complete an application. And we do have a large, um, Ready for K has a large group that we're working with, and we've already been working with them and the National Center for Families Learning on reaching many people for kindergarten application period um, and trying to make sure that any students that are five before August 1 complete that process. 
I, and I, I will, I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, well, I wanted to ask this question because you were talking about the outreach plan and I know that uh, students do that. Students have their Chromebooks now. Do they have those? Or are they locked up in the schools now? Because I was wondering, do parents have access to apply using their students' Chromebook to when it comes to application time? Do I mean, is there certain um, sites that a parent can go to on their child's Chromebook in order to fill out the application or does that not exist? The, the, the access to the Chromebook, so all of the kids basically have access to one, whether or not those Chromebooks go home every day is a local school decision. So some schools allow the kids to take them home um, on a daily basis and some schools will keep them there at school. I think what we want to make sure that we do as much as possible uh, is to make sure, uh, like to Lindsay's point about um, our outreach plan is to make sure that uh, we are helping families to complete applications. And I think as we are intentional, for example, as she may have talked about this, we want to visit all of the elementary schools in the choice zone and talk to those fifth grade parents and be there at those family nights. And like she said, be there even after that. And for the families that weren't able to show up, get on the phone and call and say, hey, uh, let me tell you, let's talk about your baby's, you know, middle school options and help them that way to uh, get those applications done. So I think it's got to be uh, a collaborative effort across probably a lot of different avenues to make sure that we get um, the information out, number one, but then to help those families um, get those applications done. Uh, as much as possible. Also, just real quick, uh, if I can go back to Dr. Greer's question about uh, small class size. I appreciate that, Dr. Greer. Uh, just one note that four of the 11 elementary schools in the Choice Zone currently operate under a small class size designation. Um, so remember that uh, in elementary schools, our class sizes cap at 24 in kindergarten through third grade, 28 in fourth, and 29 kids in fifth grade. Four of those elementary schools right now have already been or have been funded for a student to teacher ratio of 20 to 1. Um, so that gives those schools a little bit of, um, I guess, a head start compared to the others in terms of that small class size. But to uh, mm -hmm. Amanda's point, like we've got to try to ensure as much as possible in the coming years with funding, et cetera, that we can get the rest of those schools to at least that, that minimum ratio of 20 to 1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will say, and uh, thank you, uh, Dewan. families can complete the online application also on their phone. And we, in our office, um, we can assist families over the phone as well. Um, and families can walk into any school and receive assistance on a daily basis as well. Um, one thing that I did wanna say about community partnerships, is it can look different. Even if a community partner may not be able to commit right now to an event, even if it is distributing information through their platforms that they already have with connections to families, that is outreach. I mean, even if it was, you know, for example, ensuring that all of the live public libraries had our information there to be able to provide to families, that's a way to provide outreach. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an event. We will be have multiple ways. And it was important for our office because we are all about transparency and building trust that this plan will be public. Um, of course, it will be a plan that will be updated because we will have events added, um, but you will be able to see what has been done. And so I want the community to look at it if they see something that's not there to pick up the phone, call us, say, hey, did you all think about this? Or what about, like, this is a collaborative effort um, and, and this will be a journey. So I just want to make sure everybody knows we're traveling together and we're traveling together for the betterment of our students and families. And I'm trying not to preach, but sometimes I just get like it because I just want to make sure everybody understands. It, everybody, we want to have a critical eye I just want us to know we're in this together. Ian, you said you had a question. Yeah, so I think all the information has been beautifully laid out, very informative, um, and just kind of touching on things of, of equity and class size, um, I think it's, it's a good segue. How does all of this, and I mean literally everything we've outlined for today, specifically support the racial equity policy. 
Um, and does this new plan seek to improve literacy and numeracy? I'm going to say that that's, that's just all it entails. Like I will say from our perspective, um, and I know in our recent board meeting, we talked about um, the racial equity policy and the REAP that's completed to ensure that we're reviewing policies and procedures and that it's not a compliant activity. I will say that we have championed one because we knew that there were a lot of inequities that we knew we needed to address, but that has been the basis of this plan. Um, that is the goal, the North Star, the why. It is student outcomes. It is nothing else. Um, so when you talk about literacy, that when you talk about improving student outcomes, that is the basis of this plan. Now, I will say, again, this is going to be a journey. So what we have to do as a community and with families is ensure that we're having that regular monitoring, accountability, adjustments, what do we need to do differently like this? I don't think this is it for our plan. There is there are always opportunities for growth. There are always opportunities to tweak, but we are not waiting 40 years to do it again. Um, once we have the baseline this year and we move into 23-24, then we're going to be able to regularly assess what this plan is providing to our students to increase student outcomes in a positive way, in an equitable way. Um, and if we do see that there is a need for adjustments, we make those and we continue to move forward. Well, uh, I just got my little alarm to go off to tell me that we have concluded our question and answer period. I hope that this has been very helpful for parents. Uh, it cleared up a little, couple of things in my head. I would like to thank you both and Mr. Wright Thank you so much as well for helping us. And I'm going to turn this over to Ian at this time to talk about October's session. Yes. Uh, thank you, everybody, again, for your attendance today. Uh, if you give me just a moment, I'm going to share my screen and I'll give you some information on next month's forum. And so next month, October the 6th, same time, 6 p.m. virtually, we will be discussing the status of curriculum changes and it being Afrocentric. As you can see our presenters here, we have Dr. Monica Hunter, Dr. Rhonda Cosby, Rachel Klein, Avon Cook, and Lamanda Moore Rodriguez. So I will also, drop the registration link for that forum in the chat. So if you wanna hang out for a couple of minutes, um, I will put that registration link in the chat. And following that link, I will also include the, um, the link for tonight's forum. So we encourage and request your feedback. It just continues to help us get better. Um, let us know what we're doing well, what we could work on. Um, so again, I encourage you to complete that survey for us. So again, thank you all. This concludes our forum for tonight. I look forward to our next forum in October. Good night, be safe, and don't forget your booster. Have a good evening. <laughs>